What's up, guys? Welcome back to Dougster Bob Discussions. You know, I'm always searching for ways to do things differently and to become better at whatever I'm working on. So this is my next journey for the podcast. Ever since, you know, Barrick and I did our podcast thing, I've had a hard time trying to figure out what the best thing to do with it was. And so now this is kind of what it's evolving into. Live clip Q&A and BMX news. So this is like, I don't know. Look, I'm a news anchor. These aren't real glasses, but I've got the glasses. Take the headphones off. And uh, yeah, now we're a news anchor. So <laughs> this is this is hilarious. I, I think it's funny. Anyway, but, but for real, I'm going to talk about some topics that we have going on in the past week in BMX and, uh, and, and just have discussions about it. I want your guys' thoughts in the comments. I want to know what you guys are thinking. And look, these are a lot of opinions. And I say a lot of the things I say to kind of spark controversy because I want to spark discussion. If anyone wants to talk about any of this, let me know. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to run through this news section. Then we're going to talk. And then I'm just going to play the clips from the live that I do on every Friday. If you have questions you want answered, come to the live every Friday, 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time if I wake up on time. All right. So the first thing's going on in BMX. We have three different sections. Or in BMX news, we have three different sections. Videos, which are you're going to find the videos that you care about, right? There's, there's all kinds of different brands that all they do is repost stuff. So you're going to have no problem finding videos to watch that interest you. I'm not going to bore you guys by talking about every video that was released this week. I, nobody cares, right? So, but I'm going to talk about the ones that I care about and you guys find the ones that you care about. So we talk about videos, product releases that again, I care about. There's all kinds of product releases. Uh, if you guys want me to talk about a certain one, let me know, but I'll just talk about product releases that I saw um, and events, events that are going on. I might get long winded here. There's certain things that I do really want to touch on, but those are the three categories, videos, products, and events. So the first thing, videos that I just uh, saw, here's what I did. I went to one of the BMX media companies that reposts everything and I just scrolled through their videos and I saw Kevin Peraza on the Unleashed podcast. Uh, Kevin Peraza, Unleashed podcast is a monster podcast by two dudes that are actually really funny. Uh, they just sat down, talked to Kevin, interviewed him about different things that he had going on and what writing is like for him and his personal life and things like that. And you guys know, if you guys have been a part of the channel for a while, you know that personally, uh, Kevin was one of the first writers that I looked up to. He did a stunt show in Benson, where I grew up when I first started riding, like I, I was 13, 14, I was 13. And uh, he did a stunt show, massive Superman seat grab. I was like, this guy is amazing. And so that was my interaction with Kevin. I rode with him a few times in Tucson. And he's just the humblest, happiest, chillest dude. Uh, he deserves every good thing that's happening to him. So the Unleashed podcast is a really good listen for me personally, because I really love Kevin Peraza. It's like Brad Sims, Kevin Peraza. Right, right there. You know, Brad Sims is our like Lord, Lord Brad, um, but Kevin's right there next to him. Jet, do the Jets insane? The jets and then sick. it's like the story behind <laughs> it all, like he, full on pilot man. It's crazy. They fly their own plane around. Yeah, but my dad's a huge fan, and and same with you know it's it's Sal's dad. She she he's like a full on like like I said there. It's a good talk. It's an hour long. It's pretty funny. It's very entertaining. Um, and. Kevin has great stories to tell. The second thing on this list is Demarcus Paul is on the 510 Adidas team. I'm not exactly sure what their 510 Adidas thing is, but we know Brad Sims was the first person on that, making those moves. Um, when he kind of, I feel like he did his split with fit and moved on to bigger things like right away. Now, Demarcus is kind of following in the footsteps, and I think this is interesting. Is 510 and Adidas coming into BMX because they see money in it, kind of like Nike did um, in the early, what, early 2000s when we had the big BMX boom? Is that what's starting to happen with 510 and Adidas and these other brands coming into BMX, these bigger brands? I think it's great. Um, but they're very selective with their people. And in this Demarcus Paul video, he talks about how Adidas doesn't want him to be anyone other than himself. Are supporting me for me completely being me. There's no attachment. So if I want you to be this way. I want you to, to, to pursue this role or you have to fulfill these things in the light of trying to be what we want you to be. And the way I interpreted what he was saying is it kind of seemed like he was jabbing at fit and what fit had to do with um, with Brad is Brad felt like he was kind of forced to be his own, you know, a certain person for the brands. And then he got out and did his own thing, just like Nigel. Um, 
and it seemed like the way DeMarcus was wording things is that he was jabbing at these brands. Maybe it's some for him, or maybe it's just stories that he knows from the industry. I don't know, but it seemed like a jab. Hey, Adidas is great because they're going to let me be my own person and ride and do what I enjoy. They're not like these other toxic brands who are trying to, to put out your flame and not let you be independent. And that's kind of how I took it. Um, so maybe they're just making the, an independent move. They've got a certain thing that they're trying to push for and stand for as they move into BMX. But I've got my eye on you, Adidas. I don't know what you're up to, but it's kind of suspicious. Nike screwed BMX over and Adidas, Adidas is acting sus. I'm not going to lie. I don't know what they got going on, but it's kind of suspicious. So what do you guys think about that whole Adidas thing? I think it's great. Bringing money into BMX, DeMarcus, Paul, Brad, and I think Colin is on, um, the 510 Adidas now too. Um, they deserve it, right? They definitely deserve it, but be careful guys. I don't know. Adidas, they're being weird. I don't like it. I don't know what they got going on, but I don't like it. Um, I like the money side of it for BMX. I don't, I just, it just seems weird. Okay. That's it. Now here's something I've got to be very careful with. As I saw on this, um, BMX reposting website, the Vans Bloom BMX collab. Okay. And I got to preface this because I think women's action sports is incredible. I think it takes a lot of balls, which is a, a term you can't use, but a lot of balls to get out there and do that. And you're risking injury all the time. Like these girls, they're, they're putting in the work. Okay. I think it's amazing. Mad respect to all of them. Um, but I don't know how to like, how to like put this into words, but there's any kind of movement like that. Um, like not in this, not women's BMX, but it's, it's where it's so highlighted, like is Vans trying to be a woke brand, um, by jumping on early and collabing with these, um, women's BMX crews. And I guess, is that what you'd call bloom a women's BMX crew, a women's only BMX crew? What if there was a men's only BMX crew that was like, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be sexist if they didn't let men, if they didn't let women into the men's BMX crew, that would be kind of sexist. But anyway, whatever you want to call Bloom, I, again, respect. I like what they're pioneering. Um, but is Vans trying too hard to be a woke brand and push extra hard for this? And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I watched the video and the writing is, some of it is fairly impressive. But then you look at it and it's got about 30,000 views, 23,000, I think, 20, 23,000 in nine days. Lizzie skateboarding video has 1.1 million. So same channel, right? Vans posted the Bloom, Vans BMX collab, and they posted the Lizzie BMX skateboarding, or <laughs> Lizzie skateboarding video. Okay. Lizzie skateboarding video in 11 days has 1.1 million. Um, whereas the Bloom, the Bloom video has 23,000 in nine days. So that tells me people care a lot more about Lizzie skateboarding than Bloom Vans BMX. Now, is it because nobody really knows about Bloom? I doubt it. Is it because BMX isn't cool? I mean, compared to skateboarding, of course, skateboarding trumps BMX every time. Um, Courage Adams has his balance video that promotes his uh, signature kind of line and everything like that. It's got 628,000 in one month. So the Bloom video is a, a third of the way there. Now, will they hit 600,000? Will they match up to Courage's video um, in the next month? I don't know. In the next 20 days? I have no idea. I doubt it. I highly, 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 highly doubt it. So, and, and this is where I'm going with this. I have a really hard time tying everything together, but is Vans trying too hard to push this stuff? And I'm going to say, no, I don't think so. I think they're smart and I think they're jumping on top of it or like trends right away. But what gets me, what really bothers me is that there's no, the way I see it, there's no equality in highlighting a certain side of things. Now this is, again, <laughs> maybe I'm crazy, but when you, when you look at, okay, men's BMX, women's BMX, and you have to divide it, that is the opposite definition of equality, right? It should be BMX and everyone should be held to the same standard. I think, I think everyone should be held to the same standard. 
uh, there shouldn't be subcategories per se uh, when you talk about like equality, right? You could you could argue risk in street versus park or trails and stuff like that, and that's that's way over here. Like so, yeah, there's subcategories in that area, but equality to me means held to the same standard, right? Women and men held to the same standard. So it it just seems like when you're highlighting something that you know is a minority you're like, you're, you're saying this is a, is a minority and we're going to highlight it and like give special treatment to it because it's a minority. And by doing that, you're effectively saying that women's BMX isn't as good as men's BMX because you're putting a special tag on it and, and labeling it as women's BMX and that it needs some special treatment. When to me, that's not equality. Equality is like, Hannah Roberts is badass on a bike. Like Hannah Roberts is very badass on a bike, even in the standard of men, right? But then you take some subpar women's BMX rider who's riding on the coattails of the women's BMX riders who are actually incredibly talented. And that's not really fair to say, oh, you're a pro women's BMX rider, even though you're, you're an average BMX rider, but since you're a woman, you're a God. Like, I, I just don't think that's right. I don't know. I, I can't, and I'm treading carefully. I mean, not really. There's, there's nothing wrong. I don't think with what I'm saying, I <laughs> see if I get canceled, but it's just, it's weird to me to highlight it and make a special deal about it because to me, then it doesn't become about equality and maybe it's not about equality. Maybe they don't care about equality and they just care about highlighting the rad things that women are doing in BMX. That could be it too. Um, either way, they're killing it, but there's a handful of them that to me are only there because they're a woman. And you're, and, and again, that's not equality. If you're, you're giving special treatment to a certain gender, that's not equality. That's, that's favoritism one way or another. And, and I don't care. Like Hannah Roberts in Paris are way better than me. And I'm not offended by that. They work their asses off for that. But again, the ones who, who aren't, as talented or as dedicated, do they deserve the same spotlight as the women who are genuinely pioneering BMX? So, so I guess to tie it all together, Vans is partnering with very popular, talented women BMX riders, but there's a handful of other brands, I think, that are jumping on the trend with subpar women's BMX riders to be woke and, and gender friendly and everything like that by highlighting inequalities in, in the action sports world and kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's almost like they're using the, the women to make a point. And that's, to me, that's messed up, right? Because again, that's highlighting inequality. Anyway, that's my two cents on it. The video is good, very good writing in there. Um, but are these brands trying too hard to make something out of nothing or to make, you know, make a point of something that's not really there? Like it should be, the very talented women's riders are looked at just like the very talented men's riders. And like, that's fine. That's how it should be. Um, but why are these brands trying so hard? You guys know, I'm not necessarily talking about Vans, but there's other brands that come right to mind when I think of this. And uh, that's where I'm going to tread carefully. I'm not going to go into all that. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Because you guys pay a lot more attention to BMX than me. Like, you know, the the subculture of BMX. I just make bike reviews and talk about bikes. So I, I want to hear your opinion. Like, this is all ignorance speaking right here. Complete ignorance. And ignorance, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. So somebody educate me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, that's fun to talk about. Now, the next thing is a progression over everything video. And this is in the UK, a little test contest that Red Bull and Sebastian keep put together. And the whole idea is a contest where riders are not penalized for crashing. What's up everyone, I'm Sebastian Keep, and we are at the Red Bull featured test event. We've got a four round contest. And the idea is that we are creating a format that doesn't penalize riders for crashing. They'll be given a set time. They're allowed to try the dream trick as many times as they want. We're just very much in the testing phase, seeing how it works so that then we can take this to a big arena of big crowds and prize money and more riders. This sounds very dangerous. You imagine this, right? You're like, hey, to win this contest, you can try whatever you want. You can't tell people that. You got to have a safety run. You got to be a little cautious in the back of your head that you don't want to bump your head and you might have a chance at winning the contest. Now, these riders are just going best trick 
events go ham. The best trick section and BMX contests go crazy. And uh, they don't have any risk, you know, they're just sending it. So this is an interesting idea. I'm curious how it works out. They had Kieran O'Reilly, uh, Jack Watts, Ash Finley, and uh, oh, what's this? Sean, this dude, Sean, most underrated rider I rode with in the UK when I was over there for the Backyard Jam a few years ago. Sean, Ash, very, very good riders. Ash is kind of cocky, but Sean is a humble dude, very good rider. They were all there doing this progression thing. And it's worth the watch because it's like, these guys are riding at this level in a contest where where's BMX going in 10 years? It has to degress. Like it, it can't push any farther. There's no way. Like it just can't. It's insane. I, I can't. Okay. Products. We got Kevin Peraza. God, I love Kevin Peraza. We got more Kevin Peraza. Um, Kevin has a signature Vans line coming out with shoes, shirt, uh, that kind of thing. Just like Courage Adams line that came out. I have a Courage Adams t-shirt. I paid $40 for this freaking t-shirt. And I would pay the same for Kevin Praza's t-shirt. I love Kevin. You guys know this already. Um, but check out the shoes. I recently switched back over to riding Vans and I do enjoy it. You know, you Nikes, I hate Nike, but they were very light and comfortable to ride in. Switch back to Vans for more pedal grip since I started riding plastic pedals again. And you can't beat the grip. You genuinely cannot beat the grip. And the soles are very good. Very good. Van's got souls. That's all I can say. So anyway, this is a little bit, I've got a, like a whole paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. This is about Kevin's uh, Vans. Designed specifically with BMX in mind, the BMX Style 114 features BMX waffle cup construction with a new Van Doren factory pedal recipe gum rubber compound for increased grip and durability. It has the Pop Kush sock liner and... Uh, it's good. Vans BMX branding. We love BMX specific shoes. And this is actually, this is something I saw. Some dude on Facebook was trying to sell Larry Edgar Vans for like $200. And I was like, bro, you're tripping. Those were like $60 new. I, feel, I thought you could still get them. So you guys know how there's shoe collectors and stuff. Well, now there's like BMX shoe collectors. It's so weird to me, like $200 for Larry Edgar Vans. Then I saw him on those shoe exchange websites for about that price. How, what? I thought only like special custom Nikes did. I don't know anything about the shoe world, but yeah, you know, I thought it was only like special custom Nikes that you can make a four or five return on freaking shoes. But apparently, so what I'm getting at is these KP Vans might be a good investment if you guys are shoe sluts. <laughs> If you guys are into shoes, it might be a good investment. Uh, and I'm just going to run through three events. Dance Comp had a jam. Uh, I saw clips from Steve Woodward. Steve Woodward's like three hours from me. Such a cool dude. Does the craziest ice picks. I saw a lot of clips from him in that jam. Um, it, it looked like a good time. And the point of this is Dan's has been trying really hard over the last couple of years to concrete their name back into BMX. They were the biggest brand shop, in my opinion, in BMX early on. And then they had some issues and now they're making a comeback. And so they're putting on events they're giving back into the BMX community, uh, sponsoring Matt Ray. Like, it's really cool to see they're making a comeback. And um, this event was kind of cool to watch. They had the feast right now is going on. If you guys remember Simple Session, uh, was it Angie Marino? Like, just two people collided and Angie was one of them. And so everyone's like, that's why girls shouldn't be on the course. Like they were going in on her. Is it her fault? I don't know. I wasn't there. I have no idea. But anyway, Feast, we saw two people, two different occasions of people running into each other. And you guys who were mean to Angie early on would be happy to know they were both males. They were all males running into each other. So it still happens, even though there's no female involved there. Like men will still run into each other. Uh, so you guys need to go take back the mean things you said about Angie a couple years ago at the simple session. I think it was Angie. Maybe it wasn't, but either way, whoever it was, you guys be nice. Um, so, but yeah, it's crazy. Look at these guys run into each other. R.I.P. Feast always looks like the funnest contest. You get together, you like party, ride, vibe. Um, it's It looks sick. And then they had the Backyard Jam just recently in England. I think they've still got a few more stops. Maybe they're done, but I think they still have a few more stops. Uh, they do a handful of the best indoor skate parks around the UK and have a contest and they're spread out by month. So it's like four or five months of contest and then they have a final. Now, when I went there in 19... 
19? Yeah, it was 19. Uh, it, it wasn't, it was an amateur series, right? Now, this is interesting. Get this, okay? It's an amateur series, but the guys who are competing in the pro series now, because there's a pro series going on this year, were in the amateur series last year. We called them all sandbaggers. Ash Finley was a sandbagger. Cass and Downing is a sandbagger. Or I just sucked. I don't know one of the two. I think that's what people who suck say is that like the, the top people are sandbaggers. Uh, so maybe I just sucked. I don't know. But um, anyway, they have a pro class this year and, and things are insane. The clips I've seen are stupid. Uh, it, it's they're great contests to watch. If you guys are around there, you should go check out one. I feel like they have a few more stops left, but I really don't know. <sighs> All right. Now that was a lot. This has been uh, Dugster Bob Discussions, BMX News. Start a discussion. Let me know what you got going on. If you agree, disagree, whatever. Now these next few clips that I'm going to play afterwards, we've got about 30 minutes of good quality questions uh, from the live stream. These are going to be very helpful and beneficial. Some of them are entertaining, funny. Uh, let's do that. Renee says, every time I try to 360, I end up doing a 180 while landing with my head looking back. So I don't stop turning my head, but something is missing. Oh, I gave away my finger bikes. If I, I have a little bike, I, I could show you on. But anyway, so you're trying 360s when you land while landing with my head looking back. I end up doing a 180. Which way is your, is your head looking this way? Like, it's so hard, Renee, again... If you're a member, post it in the group so I can actually see the video and give you that feedback on there because it's, I don't really know what's good. It's so easy to see a video of somebody doing something and, and give them advice that way. But um, I, I can try my best, I think, for your 360. If you're doing the 360, what I see with a lot of our members is you'll hop, you'll do the 360, you'll turn enough to like get around 90 or 180 or so, but your head's still looking forward. So you're hopping, you're turning like this, and that means your head's turned around when you land. And if you think about it, your head is turned technically, but it's turned the wrong direction. So when you hop, when you do a 360, your head needs to be turned the way that you're spinning. So if I'm spinning left, my head should be looking over like that. And um, if you're hopping, you're doing a 360 and your head's looking this way, you're doing it all wrong. Your head is doing it all wrong. If that's your deal, I mean, the the solution is simple, right? I think everyone here can, can figure out the solution that you need to turn your head the other way. Now, if this, the problem something else, your head is turning the right way, but backward, I don't know. Um, either way, the three parts of the, the 360, I think three, get a good carve. So carve for the 360, good carve, gets that snap going. Um, hop as high as you can, pop up, turn your head with the carve, and then suck your knees up. And that's going to finish the spin. Those are like the three things. As long as you're carving good, you're hopping up good, you're sucking your knees up and you're turning your head, the 360 is going to come around. Uh, come around, not come around. Come around. I guarantee it. I got to pop my neck. Tell me if you can hear this. In the morning before I get going and that makes my, uh, that pops my neck. But I didn't do it today, so I had to just pop my neck. Saul says, I will never run Colt tires, especially the camo vans. Their cheeks and then some. <laughs> hey, Kirk, uh, what did you think about that dude's comment on the top, <laughs> the top video? That's so funny. He, uh, this dude commented, here, I'm just going to read it because I think it's hilarious. And Kirk was all, well, you should start your own channel and share your wisdom with uh, with everybody. Uh, I, I replied to the comment, so I'm not going to see it. Oh, he says, trash bike equals anything not chromoly. Anything with a seat so low, you have to spread your butt cheeks and rub your butthole on the seat when you casually ride. Anything with big fat tires that look like something Mr. Burns from The Simpsons had to have revulcanized post haste. Anything that claims to be super stiff. Stiffness is not what you want in a bike, but you bash around on it because it's the bike. The bike will snap in two real fast. And <laughs> so that was that comment was all over the place. Right. And then Kirk says, really similar to Doug, you should start your own YouTube channel to spread your infinite wisdom to the BMX masses. I cracked. I was laughing so hard reading both of those comments. You guys are funny. Phoenix Taylor says, is Mongoose good? I, you know, to be honest, I don't mind the Legion. What is it? 500 and the 100. The, those are pretty decent bikes. Not going to lie. Full Kamali double wall rims. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think they're decent bikes for sure. Now, obviously, the lower end bikes are not good. Their aftermarket Kevin Peraza frame is going to be really good quality. Um, so it just depends what you're getting. Like you get what you pay for. Now, I will say Mongo Mongoose is on the better end of things, especially value wise. Like you got to be careful with a lot. So Mongoose is an old school name. Uh, GT is an old school name. Redline, older school name. So those older school bikes, those old school bikes, they're capitalizing so hard right now like they're screwing i think they're screwing people because when people rode in the 70s or the 80s and the 90s like those were well-known brands those were the best bikes ever and like what they're doing now is they're like wow we have all this brand recognition from people who are getting back into the sport we can sell them a hunk of junk bike for an absurd price because now they have the money to pay for you know pay higher prices for bikes so like GT specifically, they're selling bikes that are trash for like $600 and they're just banking off of that GT name, carrying them through and people like, Oh, I bought a GT. It's like, well, the GT is not as good as it used to be. Um, and Mongoose isn't like that from what I can tell, like they they've stuck with the times, especially sponsoring these riders and doing these events. Like they've evolved with BMX, I'd say is they're, they're not like, uh, they're, they're not doing what GT and Redline are doing. That's all I'm getting at. So anyway, the higher end bikes are decent. I will say, I'll say decent. Samuel says, how do I make my bunny hop look good? They kind, they look kind of trash, even though I can hop high. What most people do, like you see the pros kind of steeze out a bunny hop or something is the biggest thing is sucking your knees up. Uh, without sucking your knees up, you can hop high, but they're going to look kind of eh. Um, but not just sucking your knees up. What really happens, what really makes that extension happen is when you push your arms out. So sucking your knees up and pushing your arms out go together. And most people forget about the pushing your arm out part. They jump, they suck their knees up and they're like, ah, oh, why do my bunny hops look bad? No promise. If you do that, you suck your knees up and push your arms out. It just makes, makes the bike like dip down a little bit. It looks really steezy. And if you, uh, the pros, what they'll do is they'll suck their knees up and push their arms out, but Euro it. So they'll kind of tweak the bars a little bit so that they're pulling in with one arm and pushing out with the other arm. And it puts it like a cool little Euro. Um, that's really hard to do, but you know, it's possible. It's possible. So anyway, Samuel, yeah, hop up and put your knees out. Um, Put your arms out. Suck your knees up. Put your arms out. Chief says, good day, mate. Hope you're well. Manual machines. Are they worth building? Also, if you were a beginner, how would you spend an hour and a half practicing three times a week? I love your work, sir. All right, Chief. Um, personally, I've never used a manual machine. Isn't that crazy? So I talk about manual machines a fair amount, but I've never actually used one um, that I can remember. So I learned manuals the good old old fashioned way. You just sit on your bike and you ride around and you pull up and you manual. Um, this is, and, and it's hard for me to relate because I've been doing manuals for so long. Like it's hard to think back to when I first learned them, but a couple things that stick out in my head is parking spaces. I would go, we had a, the park is called the lion's park and there's parking spaces there. And I would just try and manual as many parking spaces as possible, even if it's just one parking space. So I'd go, work on that, the manual, get one space, two space, three space. Um, what's also going to happen is you're going to tip over a lot. So you're going to be manualing and you're going to loop out and you might fall on your ass. I don't know. It's probably going to happen because it's such a weird feeling to jump off before you loop out. Like you figure that out eventually, but right off the bat, you don't understand what's going on and you loop out. So there was, um, one of our bike school members was practicing manuals. <coughs> in grass. And I thought that's a weird thing, but it totally makes sense now that I think about people looping out on manuals is that, you know, you are going to loop out and if you're going to fall on your butt, it's better to do it in grass while you figure out how to hop off. Now, manualing in grass is a little unproductive because grass doesn't roll, but either way. Um, so, <clears throat> so the manual machine can save you from that too. It can save you from the looping out and then you can gradually build up. You can find your tipping point essentially. Um, and with that thing attached to your front wheel, you don't actually tip over. In the manual, I feel like your, your constant goal should be to find the balance point. And for the most part, your balance point is, is right before you tip over backwards. So you want to keep the bike just below. There's a point here where if you pull back too far, you're going to loop out and you want to keep the front wheel right before that point. So to get to that point, you've got to loop out a few times to find where the balance point is. Now the manual machine is something that's going to help you with that. I think while you're rolling on the ground, it's going to be more difficult 
um, than it is on the manual machine because you've got your wheels spinning, you've got um, actual momentum moving. So the balance is just a little bit different than it is on the manual manual machine. So what I would say the manual machine is helpful for is for finding that balance point and getting awareness to where it's at. Um, I want to say it was Ryan, one of our other bike school members built one and he posted daily videos working with his manual machine. So he posted a video in the members group on the manual machine, holding it. And you can see a lot of them are kind of squirrely, but then he locked into one and sat into it pretty good for, for a couple seconds. It would have been a three, four parking space manual. And then uh, he did that for a few days and went out and actually manual. Then you could see linear progress. Like he did genuinely improve from the practice on the manual machine. So it does help you find the balance point, in my opinion, but I wouldn't rely on it completely. Like it's only, it's a tool to use to get the full manual, but it's not the the complete fix is the best way to put it. Use it to help you get better at it. But if you're not actually manualing, then it's not doing you any good. I, I mean, that should go without saying, but I feel like I got to mention that. So anyway, that's the manual. I was a big, long rant about manuals. You guys tell Chief in the comments, you guys who can manual, what helped you figure them out? And did you ever use a manual machine? Um, I see Kurt going through commenting that. And, and giving him some advice, but you guys, everyone else who can manual do it. Um, okay. Second part of the question, <clears throat> how would you spend an hour and a half practicing three times a week where you're at chief, just starting out the, the basic fundamentals that I tell everyone to start with and to work on right away is going to be bunny hop, fakey and manual. I just think those are the three things. Bunny hop obviously is most important because it's going to, um, leads to every trick, right? You can't bunny hop bar spin. You can't 180. You can't half cab. You can't do any of those tricks without the bunny hop. And so to skip over the bunny hop and work on different tricks is just a good chunk of that time working on bunny hops. There's ways that you can do to improve it, like start on flat ground. Uh, Gabe, another bike school member, would find boxes in his garage and stuff like that and put it out on the road and, uh, and find varying heights. So the first one may be six inches and he'd hop over it. And then if you land on it or you case it, the box just collapses and you don't die. Like that's way better than... Uh, a football, a football might kill you. I don't know. Um, but so find things like that, keep it interesting, find different heights to hop over things like that. Um, and then, so spend that time working on bunny hops, a good portion of that hour and a half I'd spend on bunny hops. And then when you get bored of bunny hops, mix in a manual or fakie, alternate those three, but don't spend the whole hour and a half on just those three. That's going to get boring for you. So I'd spend about half that time working on those three fundamentals that I mentioned, um, spend, you know, what, 45 minutes working on bunny hop manuals and fakies, the three of those, mixing them up. And then the other half doing something that's fun for you, whether it's cruising the skate park, the pump track, um, just riding street, like whatever it is that brings you joy while you're out on the bike, do that. Because in the effort of progressing at something and getting better at something, you can't do your best work. You can't do anything good if you don't enjoy what you're doing. So if you feel miserable, working on bunny hops, manuals, and fakies, like don't spend the whole time doing those three tricks. Spend the other half of the time having fun on the bike because again, that's what it's all about. So I'd split the two up between that um, because like I said, you gotta have fun on the bike. Otherwise you're gonna resent the sport and sell your bike and we don't want that to happen. So anyway, that's how I would spend the time. Chief, that's my recommendation. I hope that helps. Um, I'm gonna skip down real quick and read your guys's manual advices for him uh, just so I can clump this together into one video. Um, let's see. So Kirk says, I don't think manual machines are necessary but may help you learn to manual quicker. I don't know for certain. I learned by, learned by picking up a line on the ground and manualing to get past it. Okay. Biggest tip he can give you is to get your tailbone over the rear axle while keeping a figure in the rear finger on the rear brake, uh, being ready to pull it in case you start to loop out. Excellent advice. That is the most perfect advice. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So you want your back end to be over the axle. The farther back it is, the more you're, you're there's this leverage, the more leverage you have getting up into the manual. And that's a big thing. A lot of people pull up with their arms. That's a no, no. Um, if you're in bike school, the, the manual video goes super in depth about your placement and maneuvering and stuff like that. But there's other how-to videos out on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, Kirk, very good advice. Uh, what's the other? Breakfast cereal boxes are great to practice bunny hops. Okay, yeah, you could stand them flat so they're this tall. You could stand them up so they're this tall. Very good. Uh, Eat My Salt says, keep your knees bent and pump. Locking out your knees loses your ability to pump and shift your weight. And so what salt means by that 
is to me pumping he means moving your hips forward and backward so in the manual when you're about to loop out you want to move your hips forward and get your butt closer to your seat and that's going to drop the manual down and then the other part is when you're about to drop your front wheel you move your hips back and get it farther out over the axle and that brings the front wheel up and so you're constantly moving your hips back and forth to stay in that balance point point. and um, yeah and just like salt says if your knees are locked out you can't do that what's up john um okay let's see so salt says if you're about to loop out let go of the bike jump off run so you slam and run no don't slam on your face get away from the bike though don't hold on to the bike you're gonna fall i promise and uh you gotta ditch the bike anyway um okay so chief says doug question do tire does tire pressure quality um tire pressure and quality how much does it make a difference my current bike has 60 psi but the truss will have 100 psi will this help my rolling speed the short answer is yes it will help your rolling speed um, but you're probably not going to run max psi i mean maybe you will most people will run 100 PSI tires and still run 65 PSI in them. And some people will run at max. I ride 110 PSI, uh, the momentums, but I only put them at about 80 PSI. Anything more than that's too hard on my wrists and, um, and it's painful. So you got to find what you can handle. 65 is going to be a lot more comfortable for people. It's going to absorb impact a lot better. But what it does is when your tire is a lower PSI, it's gonna spread out more. So then you have more tire on the ground, creating more rolling resistance. And so what a lot of park riders will do is they'll ride 2.1s, really narrow tires at 110 PSI. One kid that I know, this kid named Kyle from Woodward, he'd put them at 120, 130. They're 110 max, but he'd put them, pump them up like way high. It, I'm like, dude, that's dangerous. Be careful. Um, but anyway, so the higher your pressure is, the harder your tire is, and the less it spreads over the surface that you're riding on, creating less rolling resistance. Now, tread has an effect too. You know, the less tread, the less rolling resistance, so on and so forth. Um, so the short answer, yeah, the high PSI will give you better rolling resistance or give you less rolling resistance, making you roll farther and smoother. Are you really going to run 100 PSI though? I don't know. I, I highly doubt it. Most people don't. Uh, so therefore, if you're running 65 PSI and 100 PSI tire, like it still wouldn't make you can put whatever psi you want that's i guess what i'm getting to is you can run 100 psi you can run 50 psi in a 100 psi tire so it's it's totally up to you and the more pressure you have in there the better your rolling resistance is going to be um less rolling resistance so anyway that's that's the answer it's gonna help but you probably won't run the whole you know the max psi kirk says with two bolitos he's pumping his tires up every three rides so kirk are they worth the money or no i have never they're cool. I get it. If you have money coming out your ears, great. Buy two bolitos. But for the normal person, like I think about four Douglas when I was younger and like we'd buy tubes from Walmart. And then if we got a flat, I couldn't afford new tubes. So I'd put them back in the box and return them and say that they came like that. I only did this a few times. Like I'm not, but you got to do what you got to do. You know, I'm not a scam artist, but damn, tubes are expensive. And I'm, a, I'm an aspiring bike rider. You got to pay for the tube somehow. So anyway, I think about that version of me. And I assume most BMX riders are like that, especially when they're starting out. And so you're like, hey, you don't need to spend $40 on tubes. I promise you, you can get the $3 Walmart tubes and finesse the system to have them for life. Especially the slime tubes. They say guaranteed never flat. And if they go flat, you're like, hey, what the heck is get a pinch flat or whatever but anyway don't you didn't hear that from me youtube don't come at me fbi is knocking anyway um are they actually worth it because i feel like they're not i think they're great the concept's great they have blowouts though you get flats like it's just it, it's a good concept but it's not there the technology's not there yet i don't think but i love to hear your thoughts kirk a super noob has no problem with his tubalitos so there you go you know you get some people have big problems some people have no problems james says hey i just ordered my first custom bmx looking forward to building it any tips with building it up um oh yeah james we got lots of tips now uh grease your bearings your your bottom bracket it, this is a recent thing that I learned I, before I just hammer it in, right? Just beat it in there. Um, but it, recently I learned if you put grease on the outside of your bottom bracket and, and put it in there, it'll go in a lot easier. It'll come out a lot easier. Use grease on pretty much everything when you're putting it together, except your bolts. Put Loctite on your bolts if you have Loctite. Um, but that's the biggest thing. 
your certain things I think are, you're going to struggle with. Like it never fails. Something doesn't go as for me, the bike build, the, vi the video. I don't know if you guys saw the video building my bike. The, the bike build went together great until I started putting the cranks into the bottom bracket. The freaking cranks did not line up to go through the, or the bottom bracket was a little bit too small or the cranks were a little bit too big. I don't know. I greased it, hammered it. Like it was bad. It took me probably half an hour to 45 minutes of just hammering the cranks in there and then I pull them out, move things around, grease it, uh, try different hammers, try different two by four, like everything, everything. I almost got a sledgehammer, but I didn't want to hurt my cranks. Um, so anyway, what I'm getting at is be prepared because it's not always going to work out like it should, unfortunately, but so be prepared for whatever is going to happen. Like have a good amount of time set aside, hours, have hours set aside. That way you're not like expecting to put it together in 10 minutes and go out and ride. Like just have a good amount of time set aside be patient with it and do everything right. Grease it, tighten everything, double check everything too. If you remember at the end of that video, I, I freaking flipped over the handlebars because I didn't tighten the stem bolts all the way. I tightened them enough to put it together and hold it there, but I didn't crank them down. And then I'm out riding and I hop up and the bars go forward and I flip over. So tighten everything too, James. That's a big tip. Oh yeah, look, Kirk says lots of grease. Yeah, for real. Um, Salt says, what 2.35 inch tires would you recommend for street? I've been through five sets in two years and still haven't found one I'm going to stick with. Yikes. What I honestly saw, just keep trying different tires, um, shift through them. I use the demolition momentums. Those are my favorite. And I was kind of the same as you. I'd go through different tires. Like I'd try one pair and I'd hate them, I'd try another pair and hate them or they wouldn't last. And I would just keep cycling through them until I found something that I really loved, um, that fit my style, that was light, that was cheap and, and gripped good for the most part. Um, and so once I found that, then I just stuck to it. So I think it'll be the same for you, you know, keep trying out different tires. You've been through five sets. Now go on to number six. Maybe you'll love it. Maybe you'll love number eight, but keep trying different ones until you find something that you fall in love with. Demolition momentums are my recommendation, but they're also not for everybody.